particles or very small particles in uh, <coughs> in porous media, uh, colloidal and nanoparticles and things like that. So uh, those are some of the new and not so old new uh, things that are happening um, in sub you know in the field. So. So what we saw till yesterday was we looked at various transport processes and we said if you have various transport processes, <coughs> excuse me, how do we uh, calculate fluxes and loadings associated with each, each of those processes. Uh, we talked about advection, advection loading was flow rate times the concentration, uh, then we talked about uh, diffusion which is based on Fick's law and then dispersion which is a combined effect of differential advection and uh, diffusion also modeled using Fick's law albeit with a different uh, dispersion coefficient value which in turn depends on a uh, geologic property called dispersivity or which is scale dependent and then it is also dependent on the velocity or the average linear velocity. Um, we looked at uh, reactions and looked at some ways to model that reactions zero order, first order, Monod kinetics and then we also talked about interphase mass transfer or transfer between the liquid phase and the solid phase as well as uh, transport in the air, air to water or water to air as well as from um, uh, concentrated substances to air uh, using Raoult's law. So, um, so we have everything that is necessary also when we talked about this we also looked at how do we get the data for these models. Uh, we talked about some field scale experiments that we can do, uh, the types of experiments that we can do. Uh, if you want to get Darcy's law or like you know get our flow rates, we need to do it, um, we need to get uh, three wells at a minimum or heads of three wells. Uh, hydraulic conductivity is typically we do not do pumping tests at contaminated sites, but that is certainly an option. Uh, you look at uh, slug tests, so I talked a little bit about how slug tests are done. Uh, then for dispersion we usually do tracer tests, so there is a force gradient tracer test and a, um, you know ambient tracer test or like you know. Um, so um, basically the force gradient test is used when uh, you have uh, a well that you are likely to pump. So if you are if you're putting a municipal water supply well or an irrigation well uh, it makes sense to do force. Uh, uh, force gradient test, but otherwise you have to do that test under ambient conditions. Um, so, which is the natural gradient test, and the natural gradient tends, tests tend to be much difficult and much more expensive, but uh, gives you a real estimate of that dispersivity. Uh, we talked about reactions. Uh, typically, we use uh, laboratory studies to get reactions. The other way to get your reaction data is to model do calibrations. Uh, there are a few tests. Um, called push pull tests like you know so you essentially inject the tracer and then you pump that tracer back like you know so it does not go too far and then you see how much of that how much of that tracer is lost and at the same time you also inject the reactive contaminant uh, and then you, you pull that contaminant back and you see how much of that is lost. Obviously what is what, lost by the tracer is what you would normally lose by doing this test. And then any addition over that is the measure of degradation or how much was lost using degradation. So, so there are tests that you can do to get reaction rates or like in a degradation rates um, from the field, but what we typically get at the field is a lumped overall degradation rate. We can't really separate out what process is actually causing it for which we have to do some control studies. Uh, mass transfer coefficients typically we go to the literature to get uh, we measure the fraction of organic carbon if you are doing or you know or get an estimate of KD based on like batch experiments which are isotherm experiments. Uh, if you want to model them kinetically we have to do again batch experiments in the lab uh, or calibrate our models like you know. So if you if we leave every parameter for calibration then our calibration by itself is non-unique and makes it even more difficult when you have more number of parameters to calibrate. So. So a lot of times we combine batch you know lab data into field data, uh, sometimes it is okay to do that, uh, most of the times it is not because our field conditions are very different from what we see in the lab like you know so that is the biggest difference. And secondly we have flow, our batch experiments do not have flow so that is another big difference. And then we have 
solids in the porous media we do not have that in the in the lab. So, that is a problem. So, we can say well we can overcome some of these things using a column type experiment uh, where we set up a column fill it up with sand or whatever particle is the uh, whatever porous media is interest of us and start injecting uh, tracers and injecting chemicals and see what the breakthrough looks like. Uh, slightly better than a batch experiment, but uh, the velocities tend to be very high like you know. So, if you are doing mass transfer type experiments you end up having mass transfer limitations because you are running that experiment at a fairly uh, high flow rate compared to what you would normally encounter in the field. Uh, so, you may end up underestimating some of that mass transfer uh, that is actually happening. And then there is always the issue of heterogeneity uh, natural world is lot more heterogeneous than what we can actually model in uh, laboratory settings. So, so obviously there will be deviations from that ideality uh, that have to be somehow accounted for uh, when we model. But nonetheless the lab and the lab experiments or very controlled field experiments give you an idea of uh, what kind of uh, uh, numbers you you are likely to expect and if you are doing calibration uh, you still have a good starting point. Uh, to work off of. So, so lab experiments even though they are not exactly mimicking the real world situation at least gets us a good starting point from which to uh, to perform our calibrations or do something with it. Okay. So, uh, we have all this information now we want to go ahead and uh, develop a model. So, so to develop a model we will just develop it for a one dimensional case which is somewhat idealized and then extend it uh, by analogy to like you know 2 and 3 dimensions. Um, so, to do that we will we'll think of an aquifer typically a confined aquifer because it has two confining beds uh, and we take a small section and since we are only considering one dimensional flow, flow like in any good textbook is from left to right and it is coming in this is my x this is x plus delta x and if I go look at this I have solid and water. So, I have some contaminant uh, that is dissolved in the water. So, we are going to look at a case where we are one we want to track a dissolved contaminant it is reactive and just to keep things simple the reaction is represented using first order. One of the advantages of first order is if you have 3 or 4 processes that are all first order you can lump them all into a single first order rate coefficient. Like you know, so, uh, that is what we will do and we have so, the chemical can undergo sorption we are going to use linear isotherm which is a representation of what type of process, what type of sorption is a linear absorption like you know with a B. Uh, so, infinite number of sites uh, we will assume it is 1 D we will also assume that our aquifer is homogeneous and 3 and it is steady state with respect to flow which means my flow rate or velocity this implies this implies ok. So, so those are our starting set of assumptions and we will start off and we will we will our model should also include both advection and dispersion. So, that is another um, includes advection and dispersive transport. 
So, at x I have q x c x is my loading due to advection and my loading due to dispersion is minus d a del c over del x with n representing that the dispersion is only happening in the liquid phase. Okay. At x plus delta x, I can write similar things. My Q is constant because I assume steady state for flow of water. So, I have Q x plus delta x. And this is calculated at x. Calculated at okay. And so this is what's happening at the boundary inlet boundary. This is what's happening at the outlet boundary. Okay. So there is transport, contaminant is coming in due to advection, contaminant is coming in due to dispersion. Contaminant is moving out due to advection, contaminant is leaving because of dispersion. Uh, and we are neglecting the effects of diffusion or we are lumping that diffusion into that dispersion coefficient. Typically, that number is several orders of magnitude smaller than dispersion. So, uh, you know, both of them roughly mean the same thing, like, you know, because it is not going to have an impact. So, what about reactions? Where are the reactions taking place? They are taking place inside the reactor. In our reactor, we have two things we have liquid, we have water, and we have solids. So, is the reaction only taking place in the liquid or is it taking place in the solid as well? Okay. It can yeah. take place in both. A lot of times, microbial reactions uh, follow like you know fixed film uh, type uh, models. So, you have attached growth, bacteria is sitting on a pore. Uh, it has access to water, it has access to nutrient and it has a way to like you know cling on to a, a substrate. So, it will just sit there and uh, is also it affects both the solid phase as well as the liquid phase. So, we are going to assume that there is reaction in both cases. Um, so, which means that we have to somehow track our solid phase concentrations as well because that is what the bacteria will, will work on. So, we are going to use C for aqueous phase concentrations and we are going to use S for concentrations. C, we are going to use milligrams per liter or grams per meter cubed uh, and S, we are going to use milligrams of that pollutant per kilograms of dry soil or you know, so whatever it is it is a mass over mass uh, uh, type concentration. So, reaction we can write the reactive flux in water which is d c d t um, or r times v right which is equal to minus k w c v w okay. v w is the volume of water in that control volume like you know say if I take this little control volume calculate the volume of water that is what it that is what I get ok. What is that? There is possibility of positive reaction if we assume that the positive reaction is also first order then we have a net degradation. So, we can remove it if you want positive you just have to put a positive positive number to it. Uh, we will just assume that the contaminant just undergoes some sort of aerobic degradation. We have an organic contaminant that goes to CO2 H2O. We are not really, we cannot really make CO2 back into that organic. Uh, so, so that is an assumption as well. So, we can add it to our assumptions saying that that there is degradation only in that reaction. 
come. So, what about uh, okay? So, what about this reaction in the solid phase? How do we write that flux? So, obviously, we are assuming that to be first order as well. So, we will put minus k solid that reaction technically could be different. Okay. So, where is it happening? In the soil. So, in the control volume uh, our concentration is S, this is milligrams per kilogram, okay. but it is happening over the volume of our soil. Right. So, what is that? Uh, so, this is in milligrams dry soil. So, if I want to get it in terms of volume, how do I, how, what do I do? If I multiply times kilograms of dry soil, get my bulk density. Okay. So, then the kilogram kilogram gets done and I am left with um, so this will give me S rho B and this will be my L reaction in the solid phase. Okay. And in the numerator, I will have milligrams or some mass of the contaminant. In the denominator, I will have the total volume. Okay. Here, I have volume of water. So, if I want to bring this back into the total volume as well, because I want to track over my entire control volume, which is Vt, uh, what do I do? Vw equals Um, if I want V t, right. So, which will be equal to what? We will leave it like that for now. Okay. Uh, so, we have this which is the volume total um, or we can leave this as well as um, kilograms S times M S which is the mass of the soil. Okay. So, that everything is this is one per time, this is milligrams per kilogram, and this will if I multiply times the mass of the soil in the control volume, I will get it to mass per time. This is the same thing, I will have this in mass per time because this will give me milligrams, this will give me one per time. So, I have everything. So, this is in mass per time, this is in mass per time, that is in mass per time, that is in mass per time. So, everything is in the units of mass per time. So, next step is we have the fluxes. So, we can write our mass balance equation. So, these are all our fluxes. So, so we have accumulation rate equals in minus out plus or minus reactions. So, what is our accumulation rate? What are we missing here? So, we took, uh, we took care of advection, we took care of dispersion, we took care of reaction, uh, sorption. Okay. So, like in the class class, we said we are using linear isotherm. So, we have S equals 
from k d times c. Okay. So that's our that's coming from our isotherm for our mass transfer. Okay. This accumulation we can have accumulation in water and then accumulation in solid. Right? So what is the accumulation in water? Since my VW is constant, I just pulled it out of the differential. Uh, so, VW does the C over dt. So, again, this has to be in mass per time term, and this would be and this would again, you know, because this is in milligrams per kilogram dry soil, I want it in milligrams per time, I multiply this with MS. So, this is the accumulation in the liquid phase, this is the accumulation in the solid phase and that is equal to inflows. What are our inflows? Q C x minus N D del square del C over del x at x, that is my inflow term minus my outflow term which is Q C x plus delta x minus n d del c over del x, let us compute it x over delta x, what is that? Which one? Oh yeah, here it is. Both of them need area, thank you. And we would also have another minus sign and the reactions okay. so i can get like terms in one place I'll pull Q okay. and X plus delta X, right? And I'm just going to slap a negative sign and change these. plus d n d a okay. because the negative sign I put outflow first negative of negative in minus out and this will be a negative plus MS. Yeah. So, what do we do next? So, we know that V is equal to A delta X, this is my total control volume. So, I am going to divide this by or V T. So, I am going to divide throughout by V T okay. and the accumulation term is V w over V t delta C over delta T plus M s over V t del s over 
delta T equals minus Q. I can write that as a gradient term, delta C divided by a delta X because okay, plus N D A delta over delta X. del x divided by a. So, I just put del a delta x into the gradient both sides and then So this is my accumulation term in the liquid phase, accumulation in the solid phase. This is my advective transport term. This is my diffusive transport term. This is the reaction in the aqueous phase and the reaction in the solid phase. Okay. So whenever I see Vw over Vt, I'm going to make that n, which is the porosity. Whenever I see Ms over Vt, I'm going to write it as rho B, which is my bulk density. And I also know that my S is equal to K D times C. So, um, del S over del T is equal to del S over del C times del C over del T. Uh, sorry. Right. And del S over del C is K D. So, we'll just switch colors. Okay. And we'll put N del C over del T plus rho B del S over del T equals minus Q over A. So, I am going to put my Q over A term as little q, specific discharge. Okay. And I can cancel this too. And the del over del X, del C over del X minus N K W C, right? Um, minus rho B K S times S, okay. and I'm going to do something now that gives me sheer pleasure as a professor because I can just go and erase the damn thing. You will have to rewrite the whole equation on your paper, but uh, I can go and erase it and uh, used to bug the hell out of me when I was a student when my professors did it. So, uh, but when you are on the other side of the desk, uh, it is the little joy that you get by doing this and making your students squirm. So, I am going to put K D. Okay. Del C over del T, and then I'm also going to add this and say K D C. Huh? Now, what do I do? I take the limits as my delta T tends to zero, my delta X will tend to zero, and I can remove those difference terms and write derivative terms. So n del C over del T plus rho B K D del C over del T equals minus Q 
del C over del X plus ND del over del X del C over del X. Okay. I'm So that's our most generic form of groundwater transport equation, one-dimensional one transport equation, uh, assuming the mass transfer is equilibrium controlled and the reactions are kinetically controlled. Uh, to keep it general, we have Ks and Kw, which are the two separate reaction rates uh, in, in the field it is next to impossible to know what the reaction rate is in the solid phase, what is the reaction rate in the liquid phase. Uh, so, all we can do at best is get one uh, reaction. So, we are going to make another assumption and then say that reaction rate in soil is same as water okay. which to us means that k s is equal to k w which is equal to some k. Okay. So, with that I am going to also do something, I am going to go ahead and divide the whole thing by n okay. and that will give me d c d t plus rho b k d okay, over n del c del t equals minus q over n del c del x plus so the n gets cancelled and then n gets cancelled here too so I get k w or I am going to call my k w k so because of this assumption here, k n gets cancelled here too. So, I get k w c minus rho b k d little k times c and what is that? The n here gets divided. I am dividing throughout by n. So, right. so now I can write this as So, in groundwater literature, this is called R or your factor. So, R 
del C del T equals minus V del C del X plus V is my eventual transport equation. Okay. So, this R here for a conservative solute K D is equal to 0, there is nothing going into the solid phase. So, the minimum value R can take is 1 okay. and for and this is for a dissolved solute like you know. So, the minimum value would be 1, maximum value can be anything depending on what that K D value is. Okay. For metals that K D will exhibit pH dependence. Uh, so, you know uh, it it really depends on what the pH range is because of the whether in which state or which valence state um, the metal is. Uh, same thing oxyanions and like you know some of those you will tend to see that as well for some. Uh, in general cations transports are heavily retarded, anions move virtually freely for the most part uh, because there tends to be a net negative charge in your aquifer because of clays and stuff like you know. So, or at least uh, I mean the charge is 0, but it tends to have preferentially the way the charges are arranged, uh, the negative charges are exposed, the positive charges somewhat not exposed in your in your clay silicates. So, as the water moves the anions uh, do not react as much, whereas the cations will have a much greater reaction. Uh, if you have organic substances, um, the they tend to be like attracts like, so they get sorbed onto the organic matter. So, for organic substances, K D is also given as F O C. F O C is the fraction of organic carbon, and then K O C is the you know organic carbon partitioning to the organic carbon. Remember, we talked about defining organic matter is a little difficult, so we normalize things to organic carbon as opposed to organic matter. Okay. F O C has to be measured in the field. This is the fraction of organic carbon that is there in that sediment. Again, we can use a carbon analyzer, and we also have K O C is written as a function of K O W or solubility. Okay. Usually, it's, it has a negative relationship with solubility and a positive relationship with KOW. You will find tens, sometimes hundreds of such correlations listed in the literature. Uh, if you do a search for KOC, KOW relationships uh, galore, like you know, there are too many of those. Uh, there are some that will give you uh, things based on uh, um, uh, more the molecular scale like you know. So, there are something called QSAR models which is a quantitative structure activity relationship models and they take a little bit more of a they look at the structure of the molecule and try to and try to predict this property like you know QPPRs or quantitative property property relationship modules. So, they take one property and try to measure it from another property and those are those types of models. So, you will find a variety of different models. Um, the physical interpretation of R is if I divide this by R, okay. so what we see is that my velocity gets divided by R my d gets divided by r which means my entire transport is retarded by that value like you know. So, the higher the va r value is uh, the lower is this number which means the if r is 1 the conservative solute will move in the same velocity as the as ground water is moving through the pores. Remember this is average linear velocity not Darcy velocity because Darcy velocity divided by the porosity gives you the average linear velocity because our, our movement is only through the pores. Uh, not over the solid phase which Darcy's law averages over. Uh, 
So, so that is why it is called retardation because the movement of my solute is retarded in the aquifer or moves aquifer it moves slowly. Okay. So, the larger this number the more slowly will the contaminant move okay. and sometimes in the literature you will see this R, sometimes in the literature you will not see that R. What does that signify? The way we got that R was because we had sorption taking place in the sol there was reaction taking place in the solid phase as well. So, if you explicitly say the reaction is taking place in a solid phase then R will show up there. If, if it is not showing up there that means you neglected solid phase reactions, reactions in the solid phase and only looked at reactions in the aqueous phase. Okay. So, so, if you do a batch experiment to calculate reaction rates, uh, if you put a batch, if you just put water and do it, then you obviously did not account for solid phase reaction. On the other hand, if you had solids and water in it and did the experiment, then you accounted for the reaction that took place both in the solid phase and in the liquid, liquid phase. So, that that is what that R signifies. Uh, we can write So, so here we assume that the flow is coming and there is a loading of V C naught or like an afflux of V C naught and once it comes on the other side of the inlet it the transport is controlled by both advection and dispersion. Okay. So, okay, if it is a point source you would have this equation at all zeros. If it was a line source or an area source or a volume source, this will be written over that distances, those distances. But generally, they'll take this form. So, no flux boundary and no flow boundary. If you're doing groundwater flow equations, you write no flow boundary conditions, which is a flux condition again, but in a volumetric flux. Here we are not tracking flow because we are assuming flow is steady. Uh, so then, so we are only tracking the mass flux of the contaminant. So if you if you track the volumetric flux of your water, then you would have a no flow boundary condition. Okay. So okay. so dQ over dx will be equal to or d h over d x will be equal to 0, which means if the heads are the same there is no flow. What this is saying is that the concentration is the same on either side of the boundary. So, there is really no flow happening at that you know at that at that location. Okay. So, we can actually solve this equation uh, analytically. Uh, Somebody has solved it for us. Uh, it's just a little bit complicated and messy equation, but uh, nonetheless, it's doable. Um, so I'll give you the link to the report from USGS that documents this uh, solutions for these equations, and they'll come in handy if you're trying to do if you're trying to do modeling. One-dimensional solutions. Um, plenty of one dimensional solutions, uh, two dimensional I showed you a two dimensional solution uh, point source. For two dimensional we can have a line source as well and for three dimensions we can have a point, a line as well as a area source you know all of them. So, you could have your source extending in x, y and z direction. If it is if it's only along x it will be a point. If it is uh, if you have x and y you have two dimensional flow which is what is called as a depth averaged condition. So, if I have a well that is screened throughout my water table and when I when I take a value from there when I take a sample from there that concentration is depth averaged it is averaged over the entire depth. On the other hand if I do a full three dimensional flow 
I could have a well that is only screened partially and I could take a sample just partially. Okay. So, depth averaged flows usually our contaminant does not spread as much in the vertical direction as we saw because of very low dispersion. So, if you use a depth average flow you tend to add a lot of you know you tend to underestimate because you are averaging over just not just the contaminant plume, but you are averaging a lot of fresh water that is in a deeper portion of the aquifer as well. So, uh, so depending on your application you would pick to do a one dimensional, two dimensional or three dimensional flows. A lot of times at the field sites we still do one dimensional flows just because it is conservative. Uh, a lot of times we do one dimensional flows because uh, they give us a it is easier to solve and they will give us an initial idea of what is going on and then we move to 2D and then we move to 3D uh, type of flows. Okay. So, generally uh, if you want to add heterogeneity if you want to say my uh, degradation rates vary over the aquifer uh, if you want to do those kinds of things then you have to solve it numerically. So, this types of uh, problems this type of differential equation is called what type of a diff uh, do you know what are the different types of differential equations we have partial. So, this is a partial differential equation uh, there are different types of partial differential equations which ones. So, there are linear and non-linear partial differential equations right we talked about it this is obviously linear. Among linear partial differential equations there are other there are different types of partial differential equations. So, there is something called hyperbolic equations, parabolic equations and elliptic type of equations. So, if you have solved groundwater flow equations the Poisson model or the Laplace model those tend to be elliptic differential equations you would written you know uh, and then this is a parabolic partial differential equation. Parabolic partial differential equations uh, the way we solve it is they are called marching value problems or initial initial value boundary value problems IBVP type problems because we have to start with an initial value and then march forward. Which one? So, if I remove the dispersion term and make it only advective, then it becomes a hyperbolic equation. Which one? The transport equation? No. If you remove if it, it can behave as a hyperbolic when the dispersion when the diffusion term is much less compared to the advection. If your advection term is much larger it is a hyperbolic equation or it behaves like a hyperbolic equation. If, if the diffusion terms are much larger then it turns like a parabolic equation. So, you so in other words if I remove the dispersion terms and just write these two that is a hyperbolic equation. Okay. If we do surface transport in surface water a lot of times our advection dominates like you know, there is a lot more advection than dispersion. Uh, so, especially if you have narrow channels where the mixing is not very high, but they are moving very fast uh, you tend to use you tend to drop that dispersion term and it becomes hyperbolic. Okay. The advantage of dropping the dispersion term is it actually goes from being a second order equation to a first order equation because the del square c term is gone. The unfortunate part is it is lot more difficult to solve hyperbolic equations numerically than it is to solve parabolic differential equations. Okay. Uh, they tend to be extremely unstable and because the movement is so fast your grid size has to be very very small to capture that. And even at like very small grid sizes there are two things that happen when you make if you do not make the grid size very small you will end up seeing. So, instead of getting a nice little plug flow type system you will end up seeing something like this which is a dispersion type phenomenon like you know. So, that is called numerical dispersion. Okay. So, sometimes uh, 
the way we solve this numerically adds a dispersion like term which has to be corrected for. So, that is a numerical dispersion term. Uh, if you are solving hyperbolic type equations where there is no dispersion, this obviously is adding dispersion when you should not be adding dispersion. Okay. So, that is a problem, but for us the velocities tend to be very slow. So, as a result we solve the entire thing as a parabolic equation as opposed to a hyperbolic equation. Other questions, does we solve this there are different types of techniques. Uh, one technique is to use finite differences. Uh, which is what we talked about uh, or there are the ODE that we solve this is a form of uh, of course, you can solve it analytically which numerically you can solve it using finite differences, finite elements, finite volumes. Uh, another way to solve is solve this portion separately okay, and solve the other portion separately okay, and then sum up those two. So, those are what are called random walk models and a random walk model what we say is diffusion is a random phenomenon. So, it just you know we randomly we add particles move the particles according to advection or remove the particles based on their reactions and then randomly disperse the particles uh, in x y and z directions depending on what you do and and then kind of simulate uh, the dispersion using that that process. Okay. Remember it we said dispersion was like our variance or our standard deviation. Uh, so, the advection gives us the average transport of the bulk transport and the dispersion tells you the spread around that bulk transport. Okay. So, so, if you want to solve these types of equations uh, you have to have some knowledge of mathematics uh, and solve it. If you want to solve this analytically the most common approach is to take it into Laplace domain and try to solve it uh, in the Laplace domain. So, idea is again we have a partial differential equation if I can turn it into an ordinary differential equation it becomes easier to solve if I have an ordinary differential equation if I take it into a system of algebraic equation it becomes easier to solve. So, so what those transformations help us do is change change so that our mathematics becomes easier. Uh, a lot of times it is easier to take it to Laplace domain, but it is not easy to bring it back from the Laplace domain. So, uh, we have to numerically invert it. So, Laplace domain can be like chakra view, huh? like you know, so you can get in very easily, but you cannot can't get out, you know. So, you can you can you can you can flip this equation into Laplace domain very easily, uh, but inverting is uh, another challenge. But we can numerically invert those things these days very easily on MATLAB or R. Uh, so, crump and other algorithms are there if you are interested. So, questions on uh, transport, transport equation. So, what is happening? The reaction is highly nonlinear or what is what is too what is too fast? Right. 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 So, if the reaction is too too fast then it becomes equilibrium. So, it is easy ok, we, we do not model it as a kinetics ok. Uh, we typically tend to use equilibrium for mass transfer because we say that the rate at which the mass transfer takes place is much faster compared to the movement of aquifer like you know. So, the velocity is small, so we are moving very slowly that we have plenty of time for the mass transfer to take place. Same thing with reactions. So, if you have highly advective systems like surface water systems under flooding and stuff uh, that becomes an issue like you know you have, if you want to do reactive transport under flooding. Uh, so, what we tend to do is to capture reactions properly especially if you have like monode kinetics or something like that uh, trying to solve it using finite differences is tough. So, what we do is we do what is called as an operator splitting method where we solve the advection and dispersion separately and then in that time. So, that can be solved on a larger time step 
but since the reaction is we want to capture the reaction much much quicker we sub discretize that time step into smaller time steps and solve the reaction keeping our advection dispersion roughly constant. So, like, you know, so, we solve for advection dispersion on one side and then we do the reaction at a much different time step. So, instead of solving the entire thing at a very small time step which uh, sometimes can add errors in dispersion and other calculations what we do is we just solve the advection dispersion part on a regular time step and then subdivide that time step into smaller things and solve just the dispersion. So, we are solving an ordinary differential equation which is our reaction kinetics and then we are solving a partial differential equation with just advection and dispersion terms. So, so that is called an operator, operator splitting technique. Uh, the downside is you are solving multiple times for every time step. So, if for every flow or transport time step the fate time step is running at multiple times. Yeah. Other questions? So, let me see. So, you can actually go to USGS and download this document and this one has multiple analytical solutions um, for 1, 2, 3D cases for a variety of different cases. So, um, um, so it gives you like you know how to solve this equation with reactions, two dimensions, three dimensions, retardation. So, you are seeing the reactions that we see and it uh, tells you how to solve them, gives you analytical solutions in terms of error functions and um, expo exponents so on and so forth. So, uh, one thing you need to know is how that complementary error function works. Uh, it shows up in a lot of these equations. Uh, if I So, so you see this complementary error function showing up a lot of times. Okay, uh, that's as that's what's called as a special function. So there are class of functions in mathematics uh, that are called special functions. And special functions have some very unique properties like you know, so if you have infinite solutions or uh, infinite series they can all be expanded as infinite series solutions and added, uh, but complementary error function has uh, a very unique property in that sense that it is the one that gives that bell shaped curve like you know, so it is loosely based on standard normal distribution uh, or the normal distribution. So, it adds to that diffusive component. Uh, so, that is why we use so that error the complementary error function comes out. Um, so, the complementary error function is called complementary error function because it is 1 minus the error function. So, it is the complement of the error function. Um, interestingly, um, you can you can calculate this in Excel as well. So, Excel has an ERFC function that you can use. If you are using Excel 20, 2010 or before, ERFC has a bug in it. Uh, so, if you have a negative argument or if you put ERFC minus something, it will give you an error like you know. So, if you are using the latest versions of Excel, they fixed it, uh, but uh, I have seen that bug ever since I first used it in 90 in Excel before it was even Excel you know Excel 1 or Excel 2 whatever it was uh, and it continued till for like about 15 years before they got to fixing it which is uh, 
tells you how wonderful Microsoft is, like you know, uh, because probably nobody was using it or complaining about it, or people who were using it were doing something else. Uh, so, but if you want to quickly look at that function in R. So I open R, run as an administrator, and if I go to Google and say, there's actually no um, So there's really no function in R, but you can write that function fairly easily. Uh, so that's the error function, so 1 minus that. So p norm x times square root 2 is what the complementary error function is. So p is the probability density function. So, um, so the complementary error function is nothing but this. If we copy that, actually if you go to R and do p norm, help p norm, where is R? I thought I opened it. Okay. It shows you what the error function here is, like an you know, a function. But in R, the philosophy is, if you can write a function from a function that already exists, we're not going to write it for you. You can write it on your own. Like you know, so, um, so they don't give it, but there is a package that does that if you want. But the easiest one would be to just put file new script and copy that. Um, This is very similar to the equation that we wrote, except now we say okay. so that is my complementary error function. I could have left it the way I copied it, uh, but this just puts it into separate lines so that you can see what is happening. Okay. So, now what I want to do is plot this error function over a large range of x. Okay. So, I am going to create uh, x which will be a sequence of starting from let us say minus 100 to plus 100 and I will go in let us go from minus 10 to plus 10 in increments of 0.1. And let us see what happens. So, that is how the complementary error function looks. Okay. Uh, it actually varies in a very small range, actually between minus 2 to plus 2 is where most of the variation is. If it is after minus 2, it becomes 2. If it is after plus 2, it becomes pretty much flat and 0. Like, you know, so, which means at higher distances, my dispersion effects just washes away. Like, you know, it's, uh -huh. So, so you, once you have that, you can once you know what the complementary error function looks like, you know what the exponential function looks like. It just keeps on going up or going down. Uh, so your solution is a combination of error functions and complementary error functions. Uh, if it's a 2D or a 3D model, you end up have to integrate first in one direction, then in another direction, then in another direction. So you will end up solving 
double or triple integrals, uh, but it's not that difficult. You, know, uh, you just have to loop through and, and solve them. So, the other part that I wanted to cover before uh, was to look at um, particle transport. So, go back to my draw box. So, when we talk about smaller particles, uh, we usually model them uh, using what is called as the collide filtration theory or some version of CFT like you know. So, basically this is how filters are designed you know uh, and the idea of a filter is to do what? So, environmental engineering is basically a big solid water separation, okay. So, we have very big particles, we remove them using physical means, we have a, we have small particles, we usually turn them into big particles and remove them in some other way, like you know, but uh, environmental engineers spend a lot of time removing particles from water, like you know, that is uh, uh, in some ways that is what they do, like you know. So, um, so the whole wastewater treatment can be thought about as big particle separation you know we want we want to do sedimentation get rid of all the big particles uh, we want to do activated sludge and like actually make the smaller particles bigger particles and then get rid of them uh, that's all we do like you know so so filtration theory um, was designed to model filter systems and then when we started looking at groundwater systems we said hey you know there is this theory already and we will we will we will take this in like you know uh, the theoretical version of uh, you know the theory behind filtration theory or movement of collide particles uh, was actually uh, is a very big area of interest in physics or was a very big area of interest in physics and the people initial researchers who won who worked on it uh, ended up getting a Nobel prize like you know. So, so I am going to talk about couple of theory, the, the theory behind doing this as well as uh, uh, how filtration theory works like you know. So, or the engineering approach on how we do it. So, what are collides? So, collides are basically substances that are dispersed in another substance, okay. So, uh, milk is a collide. So, it is got particles called casein which are dispersed in water like in you know, a blood is a collide. It is got a lot of different things uh, that are dispersed in, in water, okay. Uh, is water the only medium in which we can make collides? So, if you go to Calcutta, you will see smog that is a collide that is basically particles that are dispersed in air okay, or moisture that is dispersed in air. So, you could disperse anything in any, any, any solvent and you get collides. Okay. Uh, particles are very small, so they do not settle under the influence of gravity within reasonable periods of time. So, Stokes law basically tells us that if you have very large particles they will settle and as the particle size goes down and down and down uh, the electrostatic interactions or the other types of forces acting on that particle uh, become a larger force compared to gravity. So, gravity becomes a much smaller force and as such does not have an influence like them. So, so the electrostatic attractions or the electrostatic dis dispersion because they are uh, you know coming close to each other repulsion is what keeps them afloat whereas, gravity would basically mean that they have to come together become a larger particle and come out. Okay. Uh, the interesting thing about collides is even though you cannot separate them out uh, normally you can do you can put them in a centrifuge and you can separate things out. Okay. Uh, when you give blood people pull out plasma by 
using centrifuge like you know so it is easy to store plasma and then it is to store blood or the other parts of the blood or the contam which can get contaminated more easily uh, that is because of colloids. Okay. Um, so, uh, so you can use centrifuges to separate it but not okay. Uh, they pass through larger pores but they do not pass through smaller pores which is what uh, the basic idea behind filtration is. So, if you want to get rid of colloids uh, we tend to create smaller pore spaces and try to push them so that they come out okay. So, that is the idea of a filter right like you know so, uh, you are filtering out things. Uh, so, a colloid will just easily pass through a filter paper uh, which is about 0.45 micron or so like you know uh, 1 micron and um, whereas, they do not pass through semi permeable membranes which is what we use to remove them uh, many times. So, uh, solutions, colloids and suspensions are the three forms in which you can have particles in, in water. Solutions, they do not separate by standing, you cannot filter them, they are essentially dissolved and because they are dissolved they do not scatter light. Okay. Uh, colloids, they do not separate by standing, uh, so in that sense they are very similar to solutions, uh, but and they cannot be separated by filtration, but they do scan you know they do scatter light that is called the Kindle effect like you know. So, um, suspensions they settle out you can filter them uh, they may scatter light they may be transparent but they are larger particles. So, size plays a big role in collides uh, typically sizes are 1 nanometers to 1000 nanometers is what, what we would call colloidal substances. So, some of the nanoparticles are, are in this range uh, you could have nanoparticles that are much smaller than collides you know what were traditional collides. Uh, they could, but they could be some nanoparticles that are in the same range as the colloidal particles. Um, so, big range polymers, you know, some viruses, some proteins, all of them tend to be uh, like colloids. Okay, you could have smaller particles than them as well. So, but they're generally in the one nanometer to thousand nanometer meter range. For us, uh, what are some of the things that fall in the 1 nanometer to 1000 nanometer range? Uh, this is 1, okay, that is about 1000. So, we have viruses, we have bacteria, we have plant cells like in you know, a single cell plants, uh, you know, human eggs, frog eggs, they all kind of fall in the same, uh, same range. Um, so, if you do conventional wastewater treatment, what happens to your colloids? So, I do primary treatment, do some sedimentation, what is happening to the colloids? Right. So, we have not, so in the physical process we do not add any chemicals, we are just sending them through. So, they will pass through your sedimentation basin just fine, they will not nothing happens to them. Inactivated sludge, do you think that will remove colloids? So, there you are taking the smaller particles and trying to make them bigger particles. Some of the colloids may be removed, but not all the colloids can be removed, like you know. So, which is why we do the third step, which is since some of our colloid particles are viruses and bacteria and pathogens, we either chlorine dose it and kill them or we put UV light and like you know inactivate those bacteria which means there are colloid particles that, that escape your secondary wastewater treatment plant and then just and they and they move out. So, we have to do something about it ok. Uh, removing them is a lot more expensive than killing them. So, uh, that is what we do is either we inactivate or we uh, kill those kill those microbes. So, humic acids uh, these are also acids in soil like you know the soil is made up of humic acids and fulvic acids. So, uh, they tend to be colloidal particles, uh, some engineered nanomaterials are colloidal particles like you know they are in that range 1, one nanometer range. Uh, so, so all of them uh, are basically colloids. So, if you know how to uh, work with colloids or how to model colloids you can model some of these, uh, these particles or the movement of these particles. So, the way we model colloids in porous media uh, is you can think of colloids as a separate phase. So, you know so, we wrote the mass balance equation there was a solid phase and the liquid phase. Uh, 
now you add a colloid phase to it. So, you can only and you can say there is colloids, there is water, there is solids, the colloids can actually deposit on the solids and then the colloids can actually interact with water and exchange solutes between them. Okay. Colloid is also a mobile phase, so colloids are moving at a certain space. So, you have to explicitly model how the colloids are moving and you have to model uh, if there is anything sorbed onto the colloids, how is that, that chemical moving. Usually, we are interested in colloids, but colloids can actually facilitate transport, uh, particularly of um, um, radionuclides and trace metals. So, you know, so the colloid will form a complex with the radioactive molecule or it will form a complex uh, with the metal and this metal which otherwise would have been stick to, stuck to the soil will now move with the colloid and eventually uh, you will get exposed to that chemical. Okay. So, we talked about ret retardation and we said that the conservative solute, uh, you know the retardation is equal to 1. Um, so, for colloids sometimes the retardation is less than 1. Okay. So, if you do an experiment and calculate retardation and the retardation comes down to 1, I would first check my calculations. If it does not, you know the calculations work out fine, then it probably means that there are some colloidal substances that are causing some preferential flow paths or like you know the reason for that is there is size exclusion. So, the bigger colloids tend to get filtered out, but the smaller colloids will continue to move like you know. So, so they are moving at a much faster rate than your regular regular system. Okay. And colloids have extremely low diffusivity. Uh, which means that they do not diffuse into solid substances and such. So, um, so that so, so colloids can by themselves be a problem and we want to model the movement of these colloids because they are small particles, uh, but at the same time some of those are like harmful particles like pathogens, but sometimes the colloids which are even inert uh, because of their very, very small area. Uh, tend to have, have be very reactive and have a highly reactive surface and cause you know other chemicals to bond to them and then start moving them. Okay. So, uh, that is the idea behind engineered nanomaterials right. So, we want to put a highly reactive substance and pull things out, okay. but the risk is we do not know where the substances are going to go. So, we have to kind of model that as well. So, the fundamental theory or the theory behind collides uh, was put out by four physicists, okay. uh, Deraguan, Langeau, Verwicki and Overbeek. Uh, luckily, we do not like to you know use their names, we just use the DLVO theory like you know. So, this is this is the classic way in which we model collides. Okay. And Though those four people won a Nobel Prize for this for this very contribution on how collides collides transport like you know, so for for this contribution uh, those four were given a Nobel Prize. Um, so what it says is that you have two particles or like you know, let's assume there are two particles. Okay, these two particles will have a charge. Okay, if they come together and aggregate okay so if the forces of attraction are much higher right than the forces of repulsion then they will coagulate okay and then eventually they'll grow bigger and they'll settle okay but on the other hand if the forces of repulsion are much higher than the forces of attraction then they will stay dispersed they'll just they'll just repel which means they'll just keep moving without having to go down okay so so, we have Brownian motion where charges are randomly moving okay. and in the dissolved solute case we said that there is a net movement from low concentrations to high concentrations because as the molecules go there they are dispersed. Okay. Now, you have a colloidal suspension, so the colloid can be thought of as a separate phase, okay, not a liquid phase, not a solid, so it is almost like particles in, in, in the water right? and they have charge. So, they will randomly move through the system, but if they are if they are coming into contact with an opposite phase or if they are able to coalesce upon upon collision, then they form bigger particles. If not, they will form 
if they if not they will stay in suspension. Okay. So, there are a lot of times we want the collides to be stable which means that they repel each other and stay where they are. Okay. Uh, what happens if collides become unstable in our body? Correct, you know, we'll get blood clots. Okay, so a blood clot is basically a, a colloidal, unstable colloid suspension. Okay, that's what we would call it in chemical engineering, but uh, the doctors would call it a clot, and uh, you would call it some serious health risk. Like, you know, so, um, so that's what's happening. Like, you know, so basically, it says that if the system is stable, that means the surfaces will repel each other and the substance stays dispersed in the solution. Okay, So, that we represent using a positive total interaction energy. Okay. On the other hand, when the surfaces attract each other, then the collides will attach each other, they will grow in size and then at some point gravity becomes a bigger force than the electrostatic interactions and then they and then they will settle. Okay. So, that is when we have an unstable collide. Okay. Um, so, basically as environmental engineers remove, trying to remove collides, we love unstable collides, but as humans we love stable collides. Okay. Uh, if the milk becomes an unstable collide, you will have to throw that milk away as long as it stays as a stable suspension, we can drink it. Okay. So, there are a lot of times when we want it to be stable, there are times when we want it to be unstable. Okay. So, what the DLV or theory does is it helps us estimate the total interaction forces between the colloidal substances. Okay. So, why do you think people were interested in collides? Okay, what what prompted study of collides? So, who do you think uh, funded a lot of colloidal research? Like, who do you think was most interested in colloidal research? The people who were more interested in collide was actually the food industry, people who made ketchup, you know, people who made jams and jellies and those kinds of people really funded a lot of work because they would they would make this collides basically and put it on a shelf and there is a finite shelf life where the collide will become unstable. Okay? So, if it became unstable they have to throw it and uh, you know they will make if they if they haven't sold the product by then they have lost that money like you know so so the food industry actually did a lot of work in collides a lot of work on collides came out of the food industry like you know and uh, because they wanted to make canned foods and put it on shelves and sell it so there was some time that was they wanted to know how long it would take for this collide to go from being a stable suspension to an unstable suspension so the real weird theory helps us do that and what the real weird theory basically says that it takes care of three types of interactions. Okay, so the first are the Van der Waal forces, uh, which are attractive. Okay, so the London Van der Waal forces basically says uh, it's a charge-charge interaction, and it basically represents the attraction that's taking place. Okay, the third type, the second type of forces are the electrostatic double-layer interactions, uh, which tend to be repulsive in nature, and the third type, which happens only at very close distances, are your Born interactions which are also repulsive. Okay. So, if there are three, one is trying to pull the particles together, two of them are trying to keep the particles dispersed. Okay. Uh, if one overtakes the other two, you will, that is the condition you want to like you know remove, coagulate. On the other hand, uh, if I, if I have the other last two, let us say two and three to be more dominant than the first one, then it tends to, tends to be a stable suspension, which means it tends to repel. Okay. So, we will always have Van der Waal forces. Okay. When you have particles, there will always be uh, Van der Waal forces of attraction, and, but they may not always be the biggest particle, you know, biggest one. So, we have to somehow model or write what this force looks like, right? So, that is the model we use. Uh, we say that the force is directly proportional to the radius of the particle. So, the larger the particle, the greater the attraction. 
and we also say that the force is inversely proportional to the distance between the particles. So, if the particles are too far apart, they are not going to attract each other. Okay. So, as they get closer and closer, the forces of attraction becomes big. Okay. And if the particle is large, uh, that particle will likely have a greater force of attraction than a particle that is smaller in size. Okay. Because gravity or some form of transport is easier with a larger particle than it is with a smaller particle. Okay. So, if you want to calculate this force, we can. The only downside to that is calculating that Hamaker constant like you know. So, the Hamaker constant is a constant, it has to be empirically determined and that is what causes a problem. Okay. And this particular equation assumes our particles are nice little spheres. Okay. Uh, when we get to wastewater or when we get to collides that we are interested in in natural systems, they seldom tend to be nice little circles. So, uh, so, we will have equations like this that have been modified to account for the fact that our particles have some eccentricity or like you know, they are not spherical in shape. Okay. Uh, so, there are some correction factors put in, but the basic idea is that the Van der Waals forces are directly proportional to the radius or the size of the particle and they are inversely proportional to uh, the distance separating them. Okay. So, as we as we grow the particles, the greater will be the chances that we will we will attract them and we will grow them even further. Okay. But there is a certain critical threshold that we have to we have to cross before this force starts to take off and the stable and, and our colloidal suspension becomes unstable. Okay. So, um, so there are some empirical equations that are used to calculate uh, macro coefficients. Okay. So, that is our interactive force. The second second force that acts on these two particles is the electrical double layer or the EDL. Okay. So, what really happens is the colloidal surface is in the liquid okay. and that liquid adds a lot of complexity to our uh, to our model. Okay. So, so, the fact that these suspensions are suspended in some liquid as it tells us that you know what is the interaction between these particles and the liquid which will in turn determine how the particles interact with each other. Okay. So, what this electrical double layer theory says that is that the surfaces become charged in liquids. Okay. So, we have this colloidal particle, the surface of the colloid has a now has a charge. The reason it has a charge is because uh, there is a dissociation of some surface functional groups especially if I have like a carboxylic acid group. Uh, what is carboxylic acid? COH. Okay. So, so, I have humic acid or something that has how does the COH looks like? C. So, this is attached to some methyl or ethyl or some other group. Okay. So, when this dissociates because it is an acid when it goes into water or you know it, it, it dissociates and usually it breaks up into plus H plus okay. and when that happens now it is now that group this H plus goes away into water and then you have an O or a surface charge that is left on it. So, that is the dissociation. Uh, the other thing that could happen is absorption of ions onto uncharged surfaces. So, you have a surface, it has got a certain area and as I said a molecule can come and sit right in there. Okay. Especially if you have sodium which is positively charged and a fairly small molecule, it can go and sit nice snugly and now suddenly this inert particle has now has a charge. Okay. So, if you put particles in a liquid solution, those particles will tend to uh, gain charges okay, uh, naturally. So, when we have a charge, we cannot have a net negative, we cannot have a net charge, there has to be it has to be balanced, there has to be charge balance. right? So, what happens next is the surface charge is balanced by counter ions. What are counter ions? Counter ions are basically ions uh, 
that have an equal but opposite charge. Okay. So, we have this colloidal particle or this my, my, my tiny particle, nanoparticle, and that particle has a charge, okay, and that charge has to be balanced by some counter ions. These counter ions need not, they can be on the, on the particle itself, okay, in which case we call that a stern layer, okay, or they can be floating around these particles and stay still in the bulk solution. If that happens, then that is called the diffuse double layer. Okay. So, the stern layer is my charge, I, my particle got a negative charge, now I have added another counter ion to it. Okay. So, that counter ion is the double layer that is the second layer, but it is fixed, it is a stern layer. So, it is fixed onto the onto this particle. The other option which is more likely to happen is what we get is a diffuse double layer, which is we have a charged particle and then the counter ions are just swimming around it like you know keeping the charge uh, keeping the charge in there. So, that is your diffuse double layer or DDL mark. Okay. Um, so, what happens when these counter ions are formed? So, we got a nice little particle, it has got a negative charge okay, attached to it and we have another particle that also has a negative charge associated with it and to keep this and we have another particle that has a negative charge associated with it. And of course, all these particles are negative charge, so they are repelling, like you know, so there is certain space between them. And then we have some counter ions circling, keeping those, those charges positive. Okay. And because there is this counter, counter ion effect, or like you know, there is this double layer of this counter ion, so these negative charges are formed a layer, that is the mono layer this is the second layer which is the double layer uh, and if the double layer is still in the solution then that is the diffuse double layer. But because there are positive charges what will happen is other positive charges will get repelled out of it. You know. so, so, the solution will keep it keep repelling other particles from coming to this coming to this charge okay. and that is what this electrical double layer does. It basically says that uh, counter ions are causing you know particles to not come and form this stable suspension. Because I have this and then I might have another set of negative charges surrounded by positive charge, positive charge, positive charge. So, they, they repel and the particles tend to stay in suspension. Okay. So, how do we describe this? So, somehow we have to write a force equation. Uh, it is a long lengthy looking equation, but uh, that is what we use using De Bilens and other things and we use what is called as a modified Guy Chapman theory like you know to describe this like you know. So, I am not going to go into uh, the mechanics of it, but any book on collides or, or absorption will talk about uh, talk about this. I can give you a reference if you like um, if you are more interested in this topic, but uh, but that is the electrical double layer of the EDL. Okay. So, the net idea of the EDL is our particles because of their surface functional groups or because of the fact that they are in a solution and they have a certain size will attract some charge onto them and because there is charge on them they have to be counterbalanced by a double layer that has a counter ion or like you know equal but opposite charge and they when, when these counter ions or double layers are formed, they tend to repel each other because I have a negative charge, a positive charge surrounding it, I have a negative charge and I have a positive charge surrounding it, they can come closer, the positive and the positive will repel and the particles will go away. Okay. So, when the electrical double layer forms, we tend to have stable stable solids like you know, which means they are dispersed as opposed to being agglomerated. Okay. Uh, we have to overcome this barrier of electrical double layer if you want to do uh, filtration. Okay. Otherwise, we cannot filter this out. So, the third forces are your bond forces. Uh, they are only valid at very close separation distances okay. and basically it is a measure of free energy that is associated with, with each ion. Okay. So, essentially you formed an ion and you started with an inert particle and formed an ion. So, it takes certain amount of work to add that ion to that uh, to that particle right. Uh, 
So, that is what the bond force does is it basically says uh, the energy required is equal to the work done to take and add charge and bring it to full charge. Okay. So, the maximum amount of charge that uh, that that uh, inert substance can finally handle is your bond forces. So, these tend to be very short forces, but nonetheless repulsive forces. So, you have to overcome bond forces and your electrical double layer uh, to make your Van der Waals forces become the most dominant force and hence cause particles, particles to aggregate. Okay. So, what the DLV theory says is <coughs> you get the total charge, you sum them up, okay. some are negative, some are positive. So, it will tell you what the net charge is and if it turns out to be positive. So, by default positive charges the attraction forces of attractions are put as negative, uh, forces of repulsions are put as positive. So, the total interaction charge if it is positive that means that the collide will be stable. Okay. As I said it was driven by the research a lot of times is driven by people who want it stable or like in a college to be staying in suspensions as opposed to being removed. Uh, civil environmental engineers are probably the only ones who want that that thing to happen like you know. So, we want the opposite we want unstable suspensions okay or we want instability. So, several modifications have been proposed since DLV or DLV came with this and way back in the 20s or 30s in 1920, 1930. So, it was a, it was, this theory has been around for a very long period of time. As a matter of fact, when I took a carlite class in 94, uh, uh, my professor came and said, uh, he, he showed us a book that was in 1875 or like you know something written in carlite technology written in 1875 and he said, he showed the book and said, here is your textbook, here is this book, nothing has changed between these two times like you know, I mean you know. So, virtually everything we knew about carlites we have knew about since since early part of 19th century or late part of 19th century like you know. So, what has helped us is we have experimentally proved a lot of things what the physicists were saying at that time and of course, there is a renewed interest in carlites because of uh, nanomaterials and nanotransport that uh, uh, that we are seeing these days like you know the advent of nanomaterials. Uh, but a lot of these uh, the DLV theory was developed for an idealized sphere. So, they assumed that the particle was an idealized sphere and then anything that trapped that particle was considered to be a plate. Okay. So, the plate virtually meant an infinite amount of surface for the particle to get trapped. Okay. So, so we, we use these words particles and plates, uh, but, but that is a very idealized you know we have a flat plate and a circular particle that is uh, that is how the theory was formed. Of course, neither are our particles circular, neither are our plates straight. So, a lot of corrections have been primarily to account for the changes in geometry okay. uh, somehow put a correction factor to the geometry. The other things where DLVO has been modified is the equation has not been modified, but people have come back and said this is how you calculate Hamaker equations, this is how you calculate electrical double layer, this is how you calculate bond forces. So, so they have kept the theory as the same saying yeah these are the three main forces that are acting on the system there is no doubt about it, but the way you are calculating is a little different from way we are calculating or this is how it should be calculated in our system. But, but the very basis for it is if you understand DLVO you will understand every modification that has happened since since DLVO. So, you should start start at DLVO. So, this is one way to do it and of course, uh, this theory is not it is a great theory it is fantastic theory, but the problem with this theory is this theory is not very useful in engineering okay? because trying to calculate Van der Waal forces trying to calculate uh, electro, electrostatic double layer is hard enough even in a batch reactor okay? uh, much less at an engineered scale system or at a pilot scale system or even an engineered full scale engineered system. But, you know, so, so, engineers had said like you know yeah we like this theory this is awesome you know I kind of understand what is happening at, at a molecular level or at a microscopic level, but I really want to build a macroscopic uh, device. So, this theory is not going to work for me. So, somehow we need to build on this theory, but create a practical tool that will help us model what we want to do or model the phenomenon that we want. Okay. So, there came the traditional collard filtration theory. So, collard filtration theory was given out by Yao in 1971 almost 100 years after DLV or like you know 80 years after DLV theory. So, there was a big gap, uh, but 
his idea was to look at filtration in water and wastewater systems. So, uh, this is one time in recent history where environmental engineers have not borrowed from chemical engineers, but chemical engineers have actually borrowed from us on filtration. Like, you know, so, so a lot of filtration work and a lot of sedimentation work came out of civil engineering, which were later adopted by chemical engineers. Uh, but a lot of other theories like sorption and other things, we borrowed from chemistry and chemical engineering or even the transport reactors and stuff. Uh, is, but, uh, but this is one of the very few times when uh, the civils were ahead of the game. Like, you know, so, so basically what Yao did or said was um, the attachment, okay. So he was looking at how do these colloidal particles attach to a plate, okay. And that plate would be my filter. In porous media that plate would be the particles that would trap bacteria or microbes like you know. So the filter is to remove something, right, is to remove the particles. So he's saying how does particle, a colloid particle attach to my filter media or the plate, okay. So the plate, he calls it a collector, okay, and, and what he was trying to look at was to keep things simple, he was looking at it at steady state conditions, okay. So, so the model is designed largely for steady state conditions. Again, the original model assumed spherical plate and a flat plate, like a you know, spherical particle, a flat plate, because the mathematics is just easy. Uh, the advancements, there have been many modifications since and what they modify is either the particle does not look spherical or the plate does not look flat or the combinations of those two, but essentially what those are what I can consider to be incremental modifications uh, of this fundamental theory that has come out. So, if you understand this theory, understanding papers that follow this theory is uh, pretty straightforward, okay. So, he was looking at three mechanisms, the three mechanisms are somehow you have to intercept that particle and then you have to grow that particle and then you have to diffuse that particle out or like you know remove that particle like you know. So, those are the three uh, basic mechanisms uh, that cause filtration, okay. So, if you are talking about nano filtration, ultra filtration, sand, slow sand filtration, whatever like you know whatever the size of your pores in that filter, the idea is still the same, okay. What will change is your plate configuration will change uh, depending on your pore size. Uh, you have very little surface area in a slow slant filter or a natural filter. A uh, nano filter will give you a lot of area. Uh, the pressures will change to move that water through that system, okay. But that is not nothing to do with filtration efficiency. It has to do with the hydraulic efficiency of the filter. Uh, but uh, virtually it is the same. Uh, same theory holds true, like you know, we model it in very similar ways, okay. So, so the transport is modeled as a pack bed reactor, very similar to the equation that we see here. This is del C del T, this is your accumulation term, uh, this is the gradient of V del C del X, so that inverse triangle is nothing but del C del X term. And this side we have del square C, which is you know your diversion term, like you know which is your del, you know del square C or del X square term. Uh, and this is your reaction term with a DC DZ term in there, like you know. So, it is the movement, so it, it accounts for interception and then also the diffusion eventually like you know movement into the filter, which is assumed to be in the direction of the gravity or which is assumed to be in the direction of Z, okay. So, the water is flowing in this direction, the particles are depositing and moving down in this direction. So, that is your delta. So, this is my z direction, this is my flow direction, x direction, okay. Um, so, d is the diffusion coefficient of the suspended particles, uh, rho and rho p are the densities of water in suspended particles respectively and m and d p are the mass and diameter of the suspended particles again like you know very similar to DLBO theory, the mass, you know, they were using the size of the particle uh, and then the diameter of the particle, okay, um, kind of tell you like, you know. So, if you have a smaller particle, uh, your transport is high, okay. If you have a larger mass particle, you tend to move it down because of gravity, like, you know, so there is influence, like, so it again has this 
similar connection to the DLBA theory what DLBO said uh, except this is more an engineered approach uh, out to it. Okay. Uh, unfortunate part is this is again a partial differential equation it is got T, Z and X it is a two dimensional in space one dimensional in time equation. So, you cannot solve this equation analytically you will have to solve it numerically, uh, but, uh, uh, but it is solvable ok. Still, still first order because you are not seeing C raised to any other power term uh, that the delts kind of cover the fact that there is transport in the x direction and the z direction is written more explicitly here. Okay. So, if we do a filter we are only interested in movement in one direction and deposition in the deposition in the z direction. If you have ground water and we want to use this equation now our flow is in one direction there is diffusion in all three directions and then there is deposition along one direction. So, what Yao also did was define what is called as a single collector efficiency and what the single co collector efficiency says is that the rate at which the particles strike the collector, collector is now my filter media or that pore space or that solid phase in the in the ground water system and two the total mass of the particles that are in the vicinity of the collector. So, he is saying there are so many particles that are in the vicinity of this collector, but only some of them strike that collector. So, that defines the efficiency of my filter. Okay. Uh, obviously, if I can improve this collector efficiency, my filter will work very well. Uh, over time, that collector efficiency will drop because I have taken up you know spaces that otherwise would have trapped or intercepted the filter. So, at that point we regenerate the filter or throw away and put a new filter. Uh, so, so this collector efficiency is not something that is constant in time, but we assume that our, our filter efficiency is constant okay. just to and then what he said was ok filter efficiency is constant and based on this filter efficiency I can write the spatial component of my particle trunk bed. So, this is where he went from a transient equation to a steady state equation and said I am not going to worry about concentration changing over time because it is a filter that I am designing and I can put water through it at steady state conditions if I want ok because he was interested in water waste water application. He said if I just do steady state my time time portion is gone and my diffusion port I will remove my neglect my diffusive, diffusive transport. So, all I am left with is an advective transport through the filter as well as the removal of the filter is filtration that is taking place are the two mechanisms. So, advection moves the water filtration removes the particles that are in the water. So, he is he's down to 2 and so he writes the change of concentration over the length is proportional to the concentration. So, it looks very much like a first order equation. Okay. So, except now this is written in L as opposed to being written in time okay. and we know from hydraulic resistance time that the length and the time are somewhat related in our plug flow reactors right like you know. So, theta is V over L the velocity over ok L over V length over the velocity uh, gives you the uh, hydraulic resistance time. And we can go ahead and solve this by separation of variables, which is what he did. So, you get the natural log C over C naught is equal to some k L, similar to the equation that we solved in this class. So, uh, except that k is now not one, one word, one term, but it is got a bunch of different terms that you have to piece up to get it. Okay. So, what classical filtration theory does is it says that the concentration through the filter drops off as if our reactor was a plug flow reactor and follows first order kinetics okay. and so uh, so this theory has been basically the basis for modeling particles like you know tiny particles or colloidal particles uh, in porous media. Okay. Our nanoparticles are also modeled this way uh, by and large. Uh, 
okay. uh, and the diffusion part of the nanoparticles uh, here we are still assuming that <coughs> equation here still assumes peak and diffusion like you know because we, we wrote it using Fick's law when the particles are very very small and since they have charge uh, when they move through these pores they may come there might be some diffusion happening because of the charge. Okay. So, the diffusion is not necessarily Fickian. Okay. So, so the second change that you will see when you when you model very tiny particles or small particles is that the diffusion term sometimes has to be changed as well. So, you cannot use Fick's law. In, in the environmental applications in most traditional applications we still keep that fixed law. We still say that the particles are somewhat moving inertly when it comes to diffusion, but when it comes to filtration they have some charge and they are undergoing uh, removal via, via, via this theory. Okay. Of course, there are modifications to this theory. Again, this theory started off with nice little spheres on a flat plate. So, you know the particles are being intercepted, a circular particle or a spherical particle is being intercepted on a flat surface. The flat surface basically says that the particle is very small compared to the size of the filter media on which it can sorb. Okay. Um, people have changed that since you know we made the we made the plate curved, we made the uh, play, you know particle flat. Uh, and so there are correction factors that are added to that. Uh, so there are some more mechanistic changes that have been made. That is to say, okay, the particle is coming close. But if I have a set of particles here already, chances are I might get that repulsion, which is the diffuse double layer theory type model. But you know, so so you are you are putting charges on this otherwise inert material, you will create counter ion effect and and start diffusing the particles out. Like you know, so so there have been engineered ways to like you know model this phenomena. But uh, but the basic idea starts still with the LVO, saying that the particles have to get close to each other before they get intercepted. Uh, and then it follows our transport equation and gives us a nice little first order, uh, first order type kinetic model. Uh, modifications do add nonlinearities to it, takes away from first order, but nonetheless is uh, the same idea. Okay. So we saw collector efficiency, we solved it, and a lot of times when we do model, we can we can say that the overall collector efficiency is a function of three things okay um, and d is the collet collector coefficiency caused by brownian motion like you know so randomly the particles are arriving at that site like you know because of the brownian motions uh, these are very tiny particles and one is the collet co caused by interception so there is a collector efficiency being caused because the particles first have to come close to the collector which is the Brownian motion. The second thing is they have to be intercepted by the collector that is part of the collection efficiency and NG is a collection co coefficiency caused by settling which is the removal that or diffusion away from that surface. So, that that surface is regenerated for uh, more particles to be taken in. So, what we try to do is you know give it a little bit more more mechanistic uh, uh, feel to it and basically it says that there are three parts to it. And actually, you can calculate these three uh, using equations that are available. Okay. So, what it does is it ac accounts for the effects of Brownian motion, effects of interception, effects of settling, and then this, of course, depends on this dp, which is the size of your colloidal particle. Like, you know. so, so, a breakthrough curve is drawn for each dp depending on what particle you are tracking. So, the size of the particle. So, instead of instead of plotting one breakthrough curve like we did for our dissolved solids, now we plot multiple breakthrough curves, okay, one for each size. Okay. Remember the viruses were of one size, the bacteria were of one size, even bacteria had a range of sizes that they can be. So, not all bacteria will move at the same space and the same speed because of and not all bacteria will be collected with the same type of efficiency. Right. So, that is why you see ads that say we will remove everything like you know because our filter is small, but by golly it will remove everything that is in there like you know. Uh, the reason for that is not all particles can be removed uh, by a single filter. So, if you can create one contraption that removes all, all sizes that is a very efficient filter. Okay. So, efficient that you would have to bring a film star of some stature to tell that it is very efficient then you know people will buy it right. But, um, 
Um, but that's kind of how, how we model this. And of course, uh, the extension to porous media is pretty straightforward. Again, we have advection, dispersion. This is the K is that removal, okay, due to filtration. And then of course, this is the solid phase. So as, 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 the, as the particles leave the liquid phase going to the solid phase, there's an accumulation in the solid phase. So we have the solid phase equation, we have the liquid phase equation, and of course that K is a function of your collector efficiency, and we can actually solve for these equations. Okay. And yes. So So to kind of this is all not part of your tech, you know, the notes. So we are giving you some supplementary notes, couple of papers. Um, the first paper deals with bacterial transport and has an analytical solution. And the second paper is more on the nano transport. So your exam tomorrow will have two components. The first component is to read that, I mean, I would suggest that you read these two papers tonight. Uh, it follows the discussion that we've had today and your exam will be on those two papers. Okay. So, okay. as a matter of fact, I would love if you can come here and write that analytical solution uh, in one in that Garibedian and Harvey's paper like you know